this whole thing began with Jesus healing on the Sabbath. And it stirred up a hornet's nest with the legalist of the Jewish party, the Pharisees. And in verses 16, 17, 18, they brought two charges against him. They charged him with violating the Sabbath by healing a person. And it wasn't that that was against the law, so to speak, but it was against the handbook of the tradition of the elders. And then they brought a charge that he uh, declared himself equal with God. Uh, you can read that in 16, 17, 18. From that, Jesus launches out in verses uh, 19 through 30 with three truly, truly, I say unto you. Look at verse 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself. See, that brings a charge against equality. Unless it is something he sees the father doing, for whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. You, you talk about, boy, he, he, he really come back after these charges against him. And he says, you're absolutely right. The charges you brought against me are absolutely right. But you don't understand why. You don't understand that I'm the son of God and he is my father and I mimic him. I'm a cut off the same rug. And if you're having trouble with me now, you're going to have trouble with me every day because that's who I am. That's verse 19. Then he, he goes further into this discussion in verses 20 through 23 on that very subject. The father loves the son, shows himself all things that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him that you may marvel. One of them was just that healing they just saw. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son also gives life to whom he wishes. Boy, you talk about... They discovered a hornet's nest, and now he's poking it. For not even the father judges anybody, but he has given all judgment to the son. In order that all may honor the son, even as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. So much, for your, so much for your charges against me. Boy, he just, if, if you want some charges, I'll give them to you. Because they're all true. I am equal with God. Then in verse 24, he gives them the second truly, truly. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. I mean, holy macro. Did he ever wrench it up when he said that? Now, we take that pretty common. We talk about eternal life in Jesus Christ. They're, they're, they're equal ideas. I mean, we don't even separate those. But boy, they did. And he says, who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Now, let me show you something he did. Because, boy, he, st he stuck his finger in their eye. See the word past? Let me, tell you, let me tell you what he said so that you don't miss this. That word past is, meta, is metabino. It's M-E-T-A, which is a preposition, and then bino, B-A-I-N-O. This is a compound word uh, that means to pass from one place to another. Okay, so past, that's, that's not our problem. Listen to me what he said, though. That's a perfect, listen to me now, that's a perfect, active, indicative, third-person singular. Let me tell you the power of what he just said. 
Now, you can't see that. You have to know that in the Greek. The perfect tense, let me tell you what he just said. The perfect tense in the Greek language means that it was completed in the past or with, with the results it remains completed forever. You know what he just said? He said, I'm going to read it again and tell you what he said. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Because I'm the guy who, he just told you that the Father has life, has given that life to him. So if you have Christ, you have eternal life. Are you with me? He just said that. Now he says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment. See, that's a key word. Does not come into judgment because he's been passed with the result. He's passed. When he believes in Christ, he's passed out of judgment. He's passed so that he will never pass that way again. He's been passed from judgment. That judgment is over. He has gone through spiritual death to get eternal life. And, and once he makes that transition, if it, no man comes to the Father but through me, or all men come to the Father through me, you understand? There's a powerful idea he just told them. Listen, no more judgment. Romans 8, 1. No more condemnation to those who are in Christ. No more. You are passed in the perfect tense with the results that you will never pass that way again. You are passed. Judgment is gone because Jesus has this power over it. That judgment of Adam's sin is gone. That's why we talk about the 50 things you receive you can never lose in time and eternity. That judgment is gone. You have passed through one of those 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin and death into eternal life. And once in eternal life, you will never pass that way again. That's the perfect tense. They understood what he just said. And then he comes back in verse 25 with another truly, truly. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear shall live. For just as a father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. He's talking about the first coming. In verse 27 through 30, he's talking about the second coming. Now remember, the Jews didn't understand the difference between a first and second coming because they, the church was the mystery that stood in the gap between the first and second coming. So here's what he says. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this. Now watch this. This is the second coming. This is not the same hour in verse 26. He, listen, here's what he says. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming in which all, all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Now here's how we know it's second coming. Because he mentions two resurrections. And shall come forth. Those who did good deeds to the resurrection of life, eternal life, and those who committed evil deeds to the resurrection of judgment. See, when, they, when you get to the final judgment, <clears throat> these two resurrections and the backgrounds are important. The, the resurrection of the unbeliever is based on the books of works, and the, re, the resurrection of life is going to be based on the Lamb's book, right, of life. And so we're talking about the second coming here. Two resurrections, uh, the resurrection of the unbeliever and the resurrection of the believer. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of who sent, who sent me. It's a powerful, powerful lesson. I mean, boy, did he lay this thing out wonderfully for us. So after a word of prayer, we're going to come back and we're going to look at the executor. Jesus is the executor of God's judgment. We're going to come and take a look at that based on these messianic truths. 
I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin. You're a believer priest according to 1 Peter 2 because of the church age. Every believer is a priest. It's your responsibility to take care of personal sin. You can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. They must be confessed through your priesthood to the, to the Lord. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That takes us out of carnality back into spirituality. You, it's a spiritual book for spiritual pe people, for spiritual things. And uh, so it's your responsibility to confess your sin to the Father through your priesthood and become spiritual as you study the Word of God. Both in learning and living, you must be spiritual. Father, we're so thankful today for these who have come our way, both by automobile and the Internet. We pray, Father, for classroom etiquette, that those on the Internet would take the same responsibility. They would pause at this point, not only just for prayer, but through confession of sin, that the Holy Spirit might teach them the truth, the truth that will set them free from false teachings, uh, from their flesh and so many other obstacles, stumbling blocks to the great ministry of Christ that he wants in their life. So we pray today as we look at the subject matter of John 5 that you would minister through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, minister the truth to our souls in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice I broke at the very top of your paper, I broke this uh, context of verses 1 through 30 into three sections of study. Uh, the one healing on the Sabbath led to two charges against Christ that led to three great messianic doctrines. And for me, that is a good way to look at that. Once you enter into verses 19 through 30, you're now dealing with a sequence of, of truly, truly, I say to you, or messianic doctrines that were, were, were important for the Jewish age and for us in the transition from the Jewish age to the church age. Okay? The second thing that I want you to look at is the theme behind this entire uh, context, verses 1 through 30. There is no doubt that, that the equality between the, God the Father and God the Son are, is a major point. Would you agree? It's a major point. And so I laid that out for you in the three truly trulys. In verse 19, it's equality in God's work. Jesus talks about that in glowing terms. In verse 24, the second truly truly, it's the equality in God's life eternal life. And in verse 25, the equality in God's judgment. When you read through this, you will see that outline, I think, behind that theme. Our context today is from verse 25, the last truly, truly I say unto you, into verse 30, where there is a discussion on Jesus being the executor of, the, of God's judgment. Uh, it, it really began in verse 22. Notice back in John 5, 22, when Jesus said, For not even the Father judges anybody, but has given all judgment to his Son. See, this is where that subject matter began, right? That's where it began. That's part of that first truly, truly, I say to you, 19 through 23. It's where he introduces this subject. Then he comes back and hits it in the next two uh, tr truly, truly, I say to you, uh, concepts. And so that's important for us to remember that. It's important for us to remember. Remember that when you reach into a verse of Scripture and pull it out, be sure to read the context of that Scripture. People, they pull Scripture out of context and take it out of context because they don't read the context. And so they use that scripture all kinds of different ways that's not permitted until you've explained the full context. Scripture is never, a verse of scripture is never written alone. I mean, what chapter are you going to find that's just one verse? And if it is, there is no such thing as chapter and verses. in the original text. So today what I want to do is I want to look at five aspects in the time we have today of Jesus Christ as the executor of God's judgment. 
Jesus Christ is the executor in the plan of God of God's judgment, watch this, over life and death. Now that's the subject. Now he, there's a lot of judgment that he's over. But the subject that's mentioned here today in our text is, is, the, is the divine judgment over life and death. Because he says that over and over. And that's kind of interesting because this, in the first 15 verses, it wasn't that he raised somebody from the dead. He healed somebody that was socially dead, spiritually dead, and a whole lot of different deaths connected to him under the Jewish law. You understand? Because he was unclean. But in this, but what he does in our context, 25 through 30, is he shows the difference between the first coming and the second coming, but nobody picked it up, and that's okay. Nobody picked it up. But when you study this kind of stuff, you've got to know that when Jesus was talking to the Jew, they only talked about one coming of Christ. They didn't understand it. So in context, they didn't know between the first coming and the second coming. They just didn't understand that because the church is the mystery. So that's important to you to know that. It's important for you to get that. And so what he does here for us in the church age, he shows us, Divine judgment over life and death in the first coming and in the second coming. So in my first point, in verses in the fifth chapter, 525 through 27, Jesus is the executor of God's judgment over life and death in the first advent. We covered this subject matter last week. I went into great detail with you last week about that about Jesus having judgment over life and death. And we talked about the different people, just a few of them, that were in the Bible that he, that he raised from the dead. Agreed? And we talked about some of those people. What we learned from judgment over life and death in the first coming was there was limited authority in the plan of God. Jesus in the flesh had limited authority now, whatever he executed a judgment, that was 100% execution of the judgment. But he was limited in what he could do in the first coming, where he is not limited in the second coming over life and death. And Jesus makes it very clear to us in this passage about that. In verse 27, for example, we are told that Jesus had limited divine authority over life and death in the first advent. When he says, and he gave him authority to execute judgment, watch this, because he is the son of man. See, the son of man is an identity of the Messiah in the flesh. We call his name, when he's referred to as the, as the son of man, he's referred to as Jesus. Hmm? Matthew 121. He's called Jesus, and his name is, is identified because he's come to save his people from their sins. His humanity is going to die on a cross for the sins for the sins of Adam, right? For the sin of Adam and the sins of the human race. Do you understand that? That that's that's very important to this. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he's the son of man. We know he's the son of man because of Matthew 1, 1 through 17. In the genealogy, it shows the genealogy of the son of man. That is the Messiah that's going to come in the flesh, God in the flesh to Israel. Later, he's going to be called in the birth story, he's going to be called Emmanuel, meaning God in the flesh, that not only was he the son of man, but he's the son of God. He is also Emmanuel. He's Emmanuel. God is his true father, not Joseph. That's very important. And as a result of him being both the son of man, perfect humanity, and the son of God, perfect deity, we call that hyperstatic union in theology. Undiminished deity and true humanity in one unique man of the universe, Jesus Christ. 
And there has never been anybody like that ever. <clears throat> In Matthew, the ninth chapter, verse 6, Jesus said that I've come with the authority to forgive sin. It drove the Jews nuts. It drove them nuts. Listen, it drives people in the world nuts when you tell them that. The only way sin is forgiven is through Jesus Christ, His death on the cross, burial, and raised from the dead. There is no forgiveness of sin apart from Christ. It drives them nuts. Every, every religion in the world picks up a stone to throw at you. It's the absolute truth. Put the stone down and pick up a cross, buddy. Because that's the only way to get to God. Your religion will never get you to God. I don't care what that religion is. Even if it's Christianity. If the gospel isn't that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, it will not get you to the Father. All this goofiness going on in the Christian church today, we're going to have a whole bunch of people in the Christian church that are going to die and go to hell because they won't preach a true gospel of great salvation. They think they're okay. And listen, these people in the pulpit to preach that kind of foolishness are going to be held accountable. So, John the 12th chapter, verse 24, listen to what he said. I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. That's the first coming. That's not the second coming. That's the first coming. When he comes the second time, he's going to come to judge it. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, 27 and 28, tell you that. Tell you that. Now, here's a second point. Now, look. Jesus had power over life and death, but it was limited. Listen, he goes to the grave. When he goes, when he goes to the grave, to the tomb of Lazarus, he says, Lazarus, come forth. But he doesn't say, come forth, and we'd have had a, we'd, we'd had a traffic jam. <laughs> but in the second coming, he won't call people's name. He will say, his voice will say, come out of the grave, and everybody will come out of the grave. Now, when they talk about grave, they're not talking about grave. They're talking about Sheol. Nobody's in a tomb. I heard, I heard a great song the other day, no bones in the tomb of Jesus. Think about that. No bones in the tomb of Jesus. No bones. You know why? Because he's raised from the dead. And listen, he didn't come out of that grave as such. He came from Sheol. He was called from the dead. The place of the dead is Sheol. The place that we go out and put a marker on is called a grave. That person's long gone. He's, that grave's got nothing to do with anything other than a marker that says that's where he's buried. But listen, if he died in the house or the hospital... Boom, he's, he's, where he's, he, he's gone someplace. He's not in any grave. He's not in a hospital. He's not in a grave. He's not in a morgue. He's either with Jesus or in Sheol, in a place of torment. Right? Yeah. Amen. See, means I can preach that. That's what, he, that's what that means, Calvin. There's a message I can preach. Truly, truly, I say to you, and there is a message. Here's the second point. In John 5, 28 through 30, Jesus is the executor of judgment over life and death in the second advent. How do I know it? Two resurrections. If you know anything about eschatology, if you know anything about eschatology, you know there's two resurrections. There's the resurrection of life, and there's the res resurrection of death or judgment, condemnation. There's all kinds of terms used for that for the unbeliever. In Matthew, the 28th chapter 19, before Jesus waves goodbye and ascends to the Father. Are you with me? 
he, 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 he's saying goodbye in 28, 19 uh, through 20, and he actually ascends in Acts, the second chapter, or the first chapter, actually in the first chapter, verses 19 through 11. In Matthew 28, 19, we miss something he says because it's one of those great missionary passages. But here's what he said. He said, all divine authority... All divine authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You know, you know when he got that? When he got raised from the dead. When he got raised from the dead, when his work on the cross was completed, and he has been raised by God from the dead, and is ready now to go back to heaven to be seated on the right hand of the throne of authority, all authority, he says, I have just been given all authority. And when he gets back and sits down at the right hand of God the Father, he will begin to execute under the principle of all authority. hoo -ah. That's a big point. See, this is after the resurrection and headed for the ascension. He says, I've just been promoted. <laughs> I've just been promoted. And when I get back home and I sit at the right hand of God the Father, I have all authority. I've just been promoted by my resurrection. I've just been promoted. It's a wonderful idea. This is based on Jesus' resurrection, ascension, and session. By session, we are referring to Jesus seated at the right hand of God on the throne in the third heaven. We are referring to Ephesians 1.3 that says, Blessed is the church age believer. Blessed in the heavenly realms. <laughs> in Christ, you are blessed in the heavenly realms. You know what the heavenly realms is? That is the third heaven where Jesus sits on the throne of authority. And everything that he is sitting on in that throne that he earned the right to get, you have by grace. He's a son, you're a son. He's eternal life, you're eternal life. He's an heir, you're an heir. He's a priest, you're a priest. And the list goes on. Hooah. We are such privileged people. We are such privileged people. Why would you ever moan and groan about anything in your life? Whatever's going on in your life, Christ is greater. He's greater. And listen, you're identified with one who has all authority. We live with Christ who, listen, we live in such a more supreme position than the disciples do you not know that? Your position is Christ, and greater works shall you do than yeah, 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 yeah. Come on. <laughs> and he says, you are blessed in Christ in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Every. I like that word every. Or all. I mean, you can't get better than all, can you? All spiritual blessings in Christ. And listen, in Christ you have them. Are you celebrating in them? See, I'm a guy, you tell me I got something, I'm going to start using it. Oh, Rob, that's, yeah, you can have that, that bush hog. Well, I'm not gonna put it, I'm not gonna put it out there and say, look, I got one. I will to get out and use it. If I can't do nothing else, I'm gonna drive it to store and back. Right? I'm just one of those kind of guys. You tell me I got something, I want it, and I want to use it. I mean, I had a, you know, I was given a gun when I was a little kid. I lived on a farm. You had to learn to shoot early. Well, listen, if I had shot that gun in a week or two, I took that thing out and shot it for something. But I had to be careful because whatever I shot, I had to eat. 
So I, when I went out, I took a can, and I told my grandfather, I'm going out to shoot the can. I was very careful when I went out the woods because somehow my people always knew what I shot because I was going to have to eat it. But I couldn't stand to have a gun and not shoot it once in a while. I just couldn't stand that. So I had to, as a kid, you know, that's just my nature. Ephesians, the first chapter, 19 through 23 Verse 20 says that Jesus Christ ascended back to the Father and is seated at the right hand. Listen to how he describes it. In the heavenly realm. Do you know where you go when you die? You go to be with Jesus. Guess where he is? In the heavenly realm. <laughs> I'm already there positionally. I'm just waiting for the call. I'm already there positionally. I'm already in Christ. Ephesians, the second chapter, 5 through 8, tells us that God raised us, the church age believer, positionally up with Christ, who is seated, listen to me, in the heavenly realms. <laughs> that is a theme in the book of Ephesians. We spend so much time living in the earthly realm. We need to start living a little bit in the heavenly realm, wouldn't you think? Well, listen, Colossians, the third chapter said it. Set your mind on things above and not just things on earth. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated in the heavenly realms. You don't get better than that, people. And listen, this, this procedure will continue to the end of human history. When Christ comes back the second time in Hebrews 9, 27 through whatever, he comes back as a judge. He doesn't come back to be the savior of the world. He comes back as the judge of it. Here's point number three. In John 5, 28, 29, Jesus has all the divine authority of God's judgment as executor over life and death in the second advent. Once again, he uses the word, do not marvel. This is a present imperative, second plural, referring to all. And it means in the present imperative, with the negative not, it means stop. Stop marveling at this. When he says, do not marvel at this, he's saying, stop that. And this word, marvel, actually, in a negative, because it has a negative with it, do not marvel, it is a, a way that we might say, stop being dumbfounded. Stop being dumbfounded. Stop being dumbfounded. Why don't, you stop, why don't you stop a moment and think this thing out? Stop being dumbfounded. Stop marveling. That an hour is coming, and now we're in the second advent, not the first. An hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb, which would be Sheol in the bigger picture, will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did good, agathos, to the resurrection of life, and those who committed evil, notice there's definite articles with it, phalos, uh, to the resurrection of judgment. Ecl Listen to it. Write this down, because I don't think I put it on your paper. Ezekiel. Did I write Ezekiel? Yeah. No. Ezekiel 37, 13. I got to thinking about this, and I wrote this down on my paper. I didn't know if I put it. Ezekiel 37, 12. He says... When that happens, he says, when that, day, when that day happens, you will know that I am God. That day you'll know that I am God. When I say, come out of the grave, and everybody comes out of the grave. <laughs> 
Those who commit good will go there, and those who commit evil will go there. Those who follow the evil one will go there, and those who follow Christ will go there. Now, the Jew understood that there would be a last day and there would be two resurrections. This they understood. What they didn't understand is they didn't understand the church age. But when he says this, they understand that. Notice this will result in two resurrections. The resurrection of life are the saved, and the resurrection of judgment are the unsaved. Matthew 25, 41 and 46 tell us that the resurrection of judgment, they will go before the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20, and those who go before the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20 will be cast into a lake of fire. The lake of fire, according to Jesus in Matthew 25, 41, was prepared for the devil and his angels. That's a third of them that revolted in eternity past. That's why it was prepared. Those who follow the devil all the way to that place will wind up there. This is very serious stuff. The gospel of Jesus Christ is very heavy stuff. In verse 46 of Matthew 25, we are told that the lake of fire is eternal punishment of the unsaved, not the righteous. The righteous go into eternal life. The unrighteous, the unsaved, go into eternal punishment, judgment. It was never prepared for the unbeliever. It was prepared for the devil and then for those who follow him. Point number four. <clears throat> the resurrection of life is for the believer. At Lazarus' funeral, before he raised him, resuscitated him. Martha was upset. Mary was upset. Martha rushes out and meets him, and they have a private conversation. The importance of that conversation is what Jesus said to her and how she responded. Because it changed Martha's life. What he told her in private at Lazarus' funeral changed her life. Martha was never the same person again. Here's what he said. He said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I am. I mean, when he says I am, he means that I am, I am God. You know, like the Exodus 3 with Moses well, who shall I tell them sent me? Because they're really going to grumble and gripe. You say, I am that I am sent. Yeah. The one who has existed forever. He says to her, out of that context, I am. I am God Almighty. I am the resurrection. I am, not I have, I will give. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I have access. I could get you. Uh, maybe I could go to the pantry and help you out. I can get you medical help. There are things. No, that's not what he said. You're missing what he said. He said, I am everything I am. I am. I am lock, stock, and barrel. I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't say, I give it to you. I do this. He said, I am. Martha, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. <clears throat> yeah, I know. I know. I know you're pretty good at what you do. Lazarus, come forth. You know what Martha, you know what Martha thought as she stood and saw her brother come back? Healthy, 100% healthy. 
Jesus really is the resurrection and the life. This is not just a wind flowing through the house. This is not just I heard. This is not, oh, that sounds good, but what if? It changed her life. Not because she saw her brother brought from death to life. It changed her life because she understood that Jesus Christ uh, is an I am. That I am. I am that I am, I am that I am, I am that I am, I am that I am the resurrection and the life. And she saw something she had never seen with the great healer, with the great prophet, with the great teacher, with the great man. She saw the great I am and it changed her life. When I saw the great I am, it changed my life. It changed my life forever. It changed my life. How about you? No man can come to the Father except through me. I said, I don't know what that means. I really don't know what that really means for me. But I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe that he died on the cross for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. I'm going to believe that. This is the wild, craziest thing I ever thought of in my life, but I'm going to do this. Because if there is such a thing as being saved in time for eternity, I'm going to buy into that. How about you? How about you? How about you? Well, let's, let's pause there for a moment. We'll have a word of prayer. How about you? Have you come to the realization in your life that Jesus Christ is far greater than a great prophet, a great healer, a great teacher, a great prophet, one of the great Jews of all times? Well, I'm telling you today, if you have not come to a place in your life where you know that Jesus is the great I am, that he is God Almighty, and that he is that God Almighty to your life, and if you will believe that he came into this world to die for your sins, be buried and raised from the dead, if you'll put your faith in that, you will come to know the personal I am in your life, the personal I am that I am. And he has listened He is for you what he told Moses. He says, Moses, I am the I am for your life. Go there and tell them that and believe me. And boy, did Moses ever do it. And he is that great I am. Not that he's great. He's the great I am for your life. He's the greatest I am that you could ever have in your life. And you have him if you believe the gospel. Let him be the power source in your life to overcome the things that you know you can't overcome. Listen, he is the great I am in your life. And in Christ, we have access to all of that power structure in Christ in our life. Don't listen to the world to tell you who you're not. Listen to Christ tell you who you are. Because in Christ, you're in the great I am. Let us pray. Give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. To seriously take note that what the world needs to hear is what we're preaching today. This is a message they need to hear. Their life is in such dire straits. You've been sent to tell them a message from the great I am, just like Moses. Moses. Do you have the confidence to tell them that the great I am will take them out of their poverty and out of their mess they're in? Do you have the confidence that in Christ he is the power source to their recovery in life? 
He sets stronger today than he's ever with all authority. All authority to make all the calls necessary. Father, we're so thankful that we've come to understand that in our life, not only is he my Savior, but he is my I am in my daily walk. And I need to be conscious of that, just like Moses was when he left the desert, walked into the great world power of Egypt, and told them, the I am has sent me. The God of the I am. Moses didn't go in and say, Moses has come to get his people. No, 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 no. Moses said, God has come to take his people. God has come to take his people. That's because Moses understood who the I am was. It wasn't Moses, it was God. We need to know that. It's not about our weaknesses. It's not about our failures. It's about his strengths and his powers in us. And I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been in a discussion today on the third, truly, truly, I say unto you, out of verse 25, and we've taken it into a, a smaller context of 25 through 30, where Jesus is referring to the uh, authority of judgment over life and death. Um, and we went through, we're, we're at point four in our study this morning in the second hour, where we've been talking about the two resurrections. There's the resurrection of life, that's all believers, and then there's the resurrection of the unbeliever called the resurrection of judgment in our passage. Um, what we believe Paul has taught us about the resurrection of life, I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. This is a landmark passage uh, on Paul's teaching on this subject matter. Uh, for the church age. When Jesus lays it out in this passage, he just lays out the coming. He doesn't talk about a first and second coming. That is something we talk about in the church age because the church age has separated the first coming from the second coming. And the first resurrection or the, is the resurrection of life. And Paul takes this subject up in regard to the church for the church's understanding of that. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. And this has become the church theology on the resurrection order of life. The resurrection of life, the believer. He says, now Christ has been raised, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. Uh, he says, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the death. He, we're, again, now he's going to explain Adam and Christ. In verse 22, for in Adam all die, that's where death came to man. So in Christ all shall be made alive. That's eternal life, spiritual death and eternal life. And then in verse 23, and he's talking about the resurrection of the dead in verse 21. He comes back to verse 23. Each in his own order, and this would be the resurrection of life based on this context. And he says then uh, each in his own order, and then he says, Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming, and then will come the end. And what, what we believe he means by that is Christ the first in the, is the first in this order, and then it, it appears to us that what it means is dispensational order. Because you have believers all the way from, the, from Adam all the way to the, to the end of the human history. And everybody is in that first resurrection. It's the resurrection of believers. And it appears to most of us that he's talking about an order. Christ the first fruits, then those who are Christ at his coming. 
Now, this picks the Jew back up because the Jew believed that his resurrection would come with the coming of Christ. What he didn't understand is that there would be a gap in there. There would be the first coming of Christ, and there would be the second coming of Christ. And Paul clears this up in his own mind, I guess, because he came out of a Jewish theological context. Uh, for him, it was important to understand Christ for after that, those who are Christ is coming. That would be the order then would go like this as we see it. We have Christ, then we have the church age believers as far as an order. Now we're back into the natural order that you might understand Christ the first fruit, then the church age believer. And then we have the, what is an order is the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, you have the Jews. And then at the end of the millennium, you have the millennial believers. And that's where I put the Gentiles. But, and I do that uh, for a specific um, reason because uh, there's a reference to, and then the rest of the dead. And I'll, I'll show that to you in a moment. But we believe that the first resurrection actually has an order to it. We believe that it's Christ the first fruits, and then the church age. Now we see an order. Now we're back to the Jewish age. That's Daniel's uh, 12th chapter, you know, the, the, or the ninth chapter, where you've got the 70 weeks business, uh, which I'm going to do a study on probably on Tuesday night, as soon as I clean up Genesis. Um, I'm going to do a study on that specific part of eschatology. But... Um, but we, but we know that the seven years is the tribulation, and that closes out the Jewish age. Then we have the millennial age, which picks the Jew back up. The tribulation and the, and the millennium, they were all over the millennium. That's what they thought Jesus would do, was to establish the ideal kingdom on earth. Um, so for many of us, because of the way Paul lays this out, at least for those of us who believe in dispensations, uh, we see this as a, a crucial matter of dispensations, so we see this order. So, at least I do. I believe Paul saw it. I believe that's what Paul was teaching us. He certainly was teaching the first resurrection. He was certainly teaching Christ, then the church, and then whatever. Well, we still got some part of human history that has to go on. We got seven years, then we got the millennium. These are all human history parts before we have a completion of it. So I, I believe that's what we're talking about. And so I lay this out as I see it at least. I see Jesus, uh, the first fruit. Then I see the church age believer. I see the tribulation of Jewish age believers. I believe we go into the millennium. And then there is this phrase, the rest of the dead. And I believe this is a phrase that uh, would take us to the Gentiles as well. The reason I believe that is because this whole thing starts with them and ends with it. And then you have uh, judgments that go on uh, after the millennium. Now, for those in this church at least, there's an interesting passage in Matthew, the 27th chapter, in verses 51 through 53. For people in our church, a lot of people don't anything know about this, but of course we teach a great deal about all this stuff. You have after the resurrection of Jesus and before he sends back to the Father, you have something interesting. This Matthew's account, Matthew shows that when Jesus died on the cross, at the same time the veil of the temple was dropped from top to bottom, right? Right? In the graveyard of Jerusalem, and certain tombs were opened. Stones were broke. The tombs, you know, they were tombs with stone doors. You know, the stone rolled away business. Because they're in caves. They're opened. Not all of them. Certain ones. And they're laid open for three days. The same time the veil strikes down, certain tombs go boom, boom. You know, one here jumps over another here and jumps over here and jumps over here and jumps over here. Certain tombs were open of the saints. Those are believers who are, were followers of Christ. After Christ is raised from the dead, Matthew says, people, those tombs, 
the people that belonged to those tombs were resuscitated and walked among, went, went into the city and talked about them. People knew them. That's resuscitation. That's not part of the resurrection. This is just like Lazarus. They were resuscitated. They're going to have to die again and do all that stuff. This is not resurrection. There's no resur There's None of that's going on. So it's important you know that. And, and Paul lays that out. Paul says, Christ the first fruit. Then the second on the list is, we are the church age believer. He makes it clear to me. So uh, th that little passage in there is kind of important that you don't get, don't get crazy with that little passage. In John 6.40, Jesus said, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I myself see Paul picked that up and Paul said it be, the, resur the whole order of the first resurrection begins with Jesus because he's got to be raised from the dead in order for, to do this I myself will raise him up on the last day now the last day was Jewish see that's what Martha said to him when Jesus said, oh, yeah, don't Martha, that. I know your brother, your brother will live again. Oh, I know he will, he will on the last day. When, if, you, if you study that 11th, uh, John 11, you'll see Martha talks that way. And she's right on that in the Jewish way of thinking. What she doesn't understand is that the resurrection of Jesus, she doesn't pay attention to that part, is what's going to start this whole phenomenon. And Lazarus is a really interesting, her brother Lazarus is a really interesting subject. I mean, this is the stuff books are made out of in my heart. He was a Jewish age guy, a believer in Jesus Christ and died, went to Sheol to paradise. If he lived beyond the resurrection of Christ and his ascension and then died, he got to go to heaven. This is probably one of the few guys who got transported to two different places. See, that stuff just intrigues me. See, my head just explodes with ideas uh, on a book. It just... Pfft. I know, not yours. I said my head, not yours. That's the kind of stuff I... See, in Martha, the 11th chapter of John, in verse 24, she refers to this last day. They're talking about this resurrection. They didn't understand there would be an order to it based on the resurrection of Christ, the church age, and then dispensation. And, I, and for the life of me, I don't understand why people can't, can't see dispensational theology. That, that, just, that just puzzles me. Now, it wouldn't matter to me, but... As a student, it's just clear as a bell to me. And if you don't understand it, your history in the Word of God will get nutty in a fruitcake. That's my opinion. And, and, but now I was a guy that, that lived that reality because I didn't understand them. And uh, I, I was all over the ball, 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 ballpark. I didn't know if I was playing baseball, soccer, football, or what until I got dispensations that separate. Now, so... We're, we're told that those who are in the first resurrection have their names written in the book of life. Their names are recorded eternally in the book of life. Those who are in the resurrection of Christ, those who are in the first resurrection, uh, have their names written in the book of life, which is a big deal. Uh, that'll be an interesting book, won't it? And I wonder who puts those names in it. Huh? That'd be kind of an interesting day. Every time somebody gets sealed into that book through salvation in Christ, pff, that's got to be interesting. Somehow or another, you put a seal on that thing. Well, anyhow, that's another book in it. Here's, here's my final point. The second resurrection that he refers to will occur at the great white throne judgment of all unbelievers. The subject matter on this is Revelation 20. 
It's not the only subject, but it is the great subject on this subject matter. In Revelation, the 20th chapter, and it's well worth your read. It's well worth your read. I'm not going to read the whole thing for you today. Um, but I can tell you this. If you stand before the great white throne judgment, your name's not written in the book of life. I can tell you that. Because he tells you that. In Revelation, the 20th chapter, he tells you that. 20th chapter. Revelation 20. He goes like this. I'm going to pick this back up. At, um, I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose present earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. Now that's an interesting idea. I mean, there's a whole universe out there and there's no place for him. I saw the dead, great and small, stand before the throne. That's important people and not important people. The great and the small stand before the throne. Books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, plural, according to their deeds, evil according to Jesus. And the sea gave up the dead which was in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. You notice he said them. That's plural. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. There it is. I mean, it's really interesting when Jesus says, or when Paul says in Ephesians 4.30, that we talking about Ephesians 1, 13, and 14. Talking about Ephesians 1, 13, 14. He says in the fourth chapter, verse 30, that you're sealed, sealed until the day of redemption. Sealed until the day of redemption. And that's a signature, that's a signature sealing. Nobody has that signature sealing. That's what he's talking about when he says seal and pledged. Uh, anyhow so there it is in the second resurrection is of course the unbeliever the unbeliever it is interesting to me that here's what's interesting to me at the great white throne judgment this is the last of it we're at the end of all of this judgment business right Here's what's interesting to me. We're back, listen to me now. This is what's interesting to me. We're back to the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. What was the tree called? The Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. You know what the judgment is about? Good and Evil. We're right back, we're right back to that day. There it is. That's what this whole thing, this whole human history is based on that journey from the Garden of Eden to the great white throne judgment or to the new heaven and new earth. Isn't that something? This, this whole human race business is all based on that tree and Adam's sin and the other tree and Jesus paying for it. Got two trees and boy, I'll tell you, those trees, two trees are important because the two people are standing. The, the judgment of life, the resurrection of life is all about Christ and the, the judgment of, of uh, and the resurrection of judgment is all about Adam. And you know what stands in between that? The angelic conflict, warring over the souls of man. And you know, you know how strategic we are? We're the ambassadors of Christ to the world. You have no idea how many people that step into your six feet or you step into their six feet that would be interested in what you've got to tell them about how they could be saved.
They're hungry for somebody to tell them the truth. I was. I was. They couldn't blow smoke in my face. But when I found somebody who understood the gospel and that I was saved by grace, I was all over it. It took me a while when I say it was all over it. I didn't buy every bridge they came and tried to sell me. How did you buy that one? We are ambassadors. You must always think that way. You must always see people that way. You must see them the way Jesus saw them. He said, I, didn't, I, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. I came to seek and to save that which is lost. You know, sometimes, the other day, and I, I'm going to close with it. The other day, it was kind of raining nasty. I was going out of Chick-fil-A when this man was coming in Chick-fil-A. I rushed to hold the door open. He didn't have an umbrella. And it started to rain, and so he comes in, and you can tell he's having one of those days. He said, boy, thanks for holding the door. He's a, he's a black man. He said, thanks for holding the door for me. I said, listen, it was an absolute privilege. And he, he started to grab for the other door when I said it was an absolute privilege. He wheeled around and looked at me. Had his hand on the other door. I was still standing in, in the dry part of the building. He said, what'd you say? I told him what I said. He said, well, I don't, I don't know when I've had anybody ever say that to me. I said, well, that just came from Jesus then. And he said, you know, I thought that. When I put my hand up at that door, I thought, I'll bet you that guy's been born again. He turned around and he said, you know, I'm a brother in Christ too. It was so good. I said, well, I saw it look like he was having a hard day. I didn't know if it was the rain or he was just having one of those days. And he said, well, I'm having one of those days. I said, well, let's step aside to stand over here in case somebody comes. Let's have a word of prayer. He said, would you do that? I said, yes, sir, I would do that. You just don't know, do you? I mean, out of, out of just a, a kind act, You make a statement hoping that, you know, you throw, you, th you throw, you throw your, your hook with a worm on it. You throw it out there to see if anybody will nibble. And he nibbled, and I went, thank you. I mean, I just knew we had something. I just knew it when he nibbled. He didn't open the door and brush through and go like, Pfft. See? And I'll tell you where I get that. I get that from Luke 19.10. Jesus said, I came to seek. And I, I think if I walk with him, I, I have that attitude. I want that attitude. I want to seek the lost because I have a message for him. And sometimes, you know, the message is for you, isn't it? Sometimes this guy wheels around and he goes like, brother. <laughs> you go like, whoa. And so we exchange prayers I say, do you got something you want to pray about? He said, I sure have. And you got anything you want to pray about? And I said, I sure have. And so we have it. We, we exchange notes right there at Chick-fil-A and uh, exchange notes for prayers. I, I mean, how wonderful that is. I had the opportunity to put, it, put him on Rick. So I, got, I got a guy over in Burma. He was of the age he would understand that. Needs our prayers, and he said he's got them. Father, we're thankful today for your love, mercy, and grace. What a man, this man called Jesus, came to save his people from their sins.
I mean, is there power in that name? <laughs> no other name under heaven given among men. No other name. Just at the mere, mere name of Jesus. But they don't know what it means. They don't know how, why he came. Make us good ambassadors of that out of this church, Father. We've got the message. Oh, boy, have we got the message. But we just have eyes to see. The lost. Just walking around in a daze. Encourage our hearts with it, Father. We need to be great ambassadors for Christ in our homeland. Give us eyes to see. Hearts to be compassionate. And lips that will speak the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his name we've prayed. Amen.